This podcast was made possible by the Office of Communications for the Catholic Diocese of Arlington, which is funded in part by the Bishop's Lenten Appeal and the Catholic Communications Campaign. We thank all who support these critical appeals and the ministries they fund. You're listening to Searching for More, a podcast of the Diocese of Arlington. On this episode, as Catholics, we strive to live our faith in our homes, parishes, and communities. But how do we live our faith in the public and political arena? Hear how the Virginia Catholic Conference advocates for principles of Catholic social teaching in Richmond and Washington on behalf of the Virginia bishops. This episode's host is Diana Sim Snyder, Deputy Director of Communications for the Diocese. Welcome to the program. Our guest today is Jeff Caruso, Executive Director of the Virginia Catholic Conference. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Diana. I'm delighted to be here. (laughs) On a personal note, Jeff and I have worked together at the conference for many years, so I'm glad to be able to talk to you this morning for Searching for More. Before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about the Virginia Catholic Conference Well, Diana, the Virginia Catholic Conference was founded in 2004, late 2004, uh, by Bishop Laverde and Bishop DiLorenzo. And uh, we started our day-to-day full-time operations in January of 2005. And um, our our role is to be the uh, public policy office of Virginia's Catholic bishops in their two dioceses. Good. Okay. And how did you come to the Virginia Catholic Conference? I had been working at the Maryland Catholic Conference um, starting in 1998 and um, then was uh, hired to come here at the beginning of 2005. So I've I've had that experience with the State Catholic Conference work and um, was was, uh, delighted to have this opportunity to be able to continue that and and to um, push forward here in Virginia. So you just decide to swim across the river and, and help get things done here. I'm a terrible swimmer, but yes, that's, <laughs> that's accurate otherwise. <laughs> okay. So tell us a little bit about how the VCC works. So we're the public policy office of, of the uh, two bishops and their two dioceses. So um, we're delighted to um, represent Bishop Burbage and Bishop Nestout and the Diocese of Arlington and Richmond in public policy matters. Uh, it's primarily at the state level. And uh, so we do a lot of work at the Virginia General Assembly. And um, then secondarily, we do some work at the federal level, and and that's uh, under the um, guidance and leadership of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops. Okay. And when you say that you work in Richmond with legislation, um, how do you work with legislators specifically? Do you work with legislators um, from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party or both? We work very closely uh, with legislators from both sides of the aisle, and uh, our our advocacy um, is uh, based on the uh, legislative priorities of Bishop Burbage and Bishop Nestout in their two dioceses, and and our our role is to to take that that public policy agenda um, that that they lead and guide and and and. Um, uh, help us to to form, uh, and then we we take what what they've um, decided and formed, and we uh, promote that at the general assembly through uh, testifying at committees. Uh, we meet one on one very often with legislators. Uh, we work in coalition with other groups, and. Um, as you know, we work on a wide range of issues uh, across the, the spectrum of Catholic moral and social teaching. Uh, so that gets into um, all sorts of, of areas uh, where we have an opportunity to work with uh, folks on both sides of the aisle. And um, very often we'll see that on, on one particular day we're, we're working uh, in concert with a particular legislator or a particular legislators of a particular party, and then the very next day we may be uh, working in concert with a legislator that had opposed us the day before on something. So uh, we, we do have a lot of opportunities to um, work across the aisle with with um, with legislators. We, we can normally find um, areas of agreement with just about anyone, but uh, conversely also uh, areas of disagreement and sometimes, sometimes very fundamental ones. 
So you're saying that that we work with both parties. We work with Democrats. We work with Republicans. Um, what we we work with those who have like mind on the issues. Yes, we're uh, issue oriented. So um, our our goal is to uh, advance or in some cases stop legislation. And so uh, wherever we need to work together with folks to either advance or stop the legislation that's on our agenda, that's what we do. Okay, good. Well, what about um, how does the Virginia Catholic Conference work with um, with parishes within the Diocese of Arlington and the Diocese of Richmond? Very, very important part of our work. So uh, grassroots advocacy, which just means constituents directly contacting their legislators, uh, is is such an important part of our work, being able to promote and advance and grow the grassroots, uh, because very often legislators will tell us that um, what they uh, listen to the most and, and the input that matters the most is how their constituents want them to vote on particular pieces of legislation. And we know from uh, faithful citizenship uh, that it's it's uh, part of our baptismal responsibility to engage in the political process and to try to advance the causes of the life and dignity of the human person and the common good. And so then it becomes our responsibility to try to make that uh, as easy and as meaningful for people as possible, uh, so that really so that they can uh, practice their faith in this way. Mm -hmm. So we, we do reach out um, to parishes and and uh, try to get people enrolled in the Virginia Catholic Conference email network. And um, uh, that to uh, learn more about that, go to vacatholic.org. And uh, there's a, a link right at the top that says join the network. So um, I would encourage people to join join that network. And then there's there's also ways that people can engage more directly. But the the email network uh, gives people a chance to to get alerts from us and and uh, important updates and and um, also learn more about events that we're sponsoring. Mm -hmm. Jeff, you mentioned um, faithful citizenship, the document that the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops put out many years ago, and I guess I've updated a couple times since. Um, broadly speaking, can you say what kinds of issues the Virginia Catholic Conference works on? Well, it really just relates to the life and dignity of the human person and um, uh whether whether that involves um, direct threats to life itself, uh, we we know that the the areas of um, abortion and assisted suicide and uh, destruction of embryos in research, um, we know that the the issue of the the death penalty is is also an important life issue, um, protecting people in terms of of uh, safety from guns and firearms. And then um, a whole range of issues that also relate to the dignity of the human person, whether it's the dignity of work or access to health care um, or, um, you know, fair wages, uh, also family life, um, what the, the fundamental unit of the family and, and the, the definition of marriage and um, uh, immigrant rights and and uh, uh, protecting and and working to help immigrant families and and those who are who are fleeing this country uh, from persecution in in other countries or or um, or very dire circumstances there and uh, so it's the life and the dignity of the human person and then also the common good. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you're you're involved in the the issues that are really most important to the human person, the family. Um, religious liberty. Religious liberty is a very important one. I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, uh, if uh, that's really our, our first freedom, uh, and it's very much tied to the founding of our country, and it's also very much tied to the teaching of, of our church and, and our ability to have the freedom to serve. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a minute ago about grassroots, ab grassroots advocacy. Um, and how legislators tell you that it's so important to hear from their constituents about how they feel on the issues. Can you think of any times where the Virginia Catholic Conference has been able to, to stir up those grassroots to get them to engage on important issues and, and that engagement has impacted the legislation? I could count over the years a number of times where we either won or lost by one vote. Huh. And I, I can... 
honestly say that in in those moments, um, the the grassroots is either what pushed it over the top or, or didn't. Um, there there was uh, one time in particular when I can remember we were fighting against legislation uh, that would have expanded the death penalty, hmm. and we were able to rally the grassroots and we were able to stop that expansion effort. Uh, there was another time when we got some uh, good uh, restrictions against abortion funding. And again, I think it was the, the grassroots that really helped to push that over the top. I, I can think of uh, a couple other examples in the school choice realm on mm-hmm. uh, creating the scholarship tax credit where the grassroots really helped to push that over the top. So it's really important for people to Catholics in our diocese to know about the conference and to get involved in the conference's work? It is. It's. It's a. a as faithful citizenship teaches, it's part of the practice of our, our faith to engage in the political process and to do so in a way that that helps our, our brothers and sisters most in need and protects the poorest and most vulnerable. And um, so it's it's a part of the practice of our faith and and it's uh, very much a part of the mission of our office and something we try to help people to do. Yeah. Jeff, looking at um, the recent General Assembly session. Can you say what were what were the most important kind of issues that you dealt with this past session? Well, protecting the unborn uh, is always a, a paramount issue, and uh, it was really front and center uh, during this General Assembly mm-hmm. session in particular. Uh, there were some uh, extremely bad uh, pieces of legislation introduced, and fortunately, all of them were defeated. Uh, but there was one bill that, that would have rolled back uh, quite a few of the restrictions that we have on on the books on abortion and, and would have um, rolled back uh, a lot of current pro-life protections. Uh, for example, the legislation would have made it um, easier for uh, women to have a, a third trimester abortion all the way up until birth. Uh, it would have removed some of the informed consent protections, such as the ultrasound requirement. Uh, and it would have um, done away with a, a lot of uh, current standards that we have right now for uh, abortion clinics, um, mm-hmm. health and safety standards that they have to adhere to. So um, fortunately, that legislation, I know it, it received a lot of attention, and we're, we're glad that it did because it really rallied the pro-life community, but that, that legislation was defeated. And uh, then there was another bill that would have um, actually made it a quote-unquote fundamental right um, to have access to abortion, contraception, and sterilization, uh, which, uh, of course, is completely in contraindication to the true fundamental right to life. And uh, that legislation, again, was defeated. Um, and it's something that uh, I think in, in uh, the weeks since then, and, and I'm sure in the months to come, is going to really continue to rally the pro-life community. And um, uh, the other... The other um, uh, piece of legislation uh, on the in the area of abortion uh, that we were able to defeat it was the um, Equal Rights Amendment or ERA. Um, now, you know, on its on its face, um, you know, it was about um, uh, promoting equality, uh, which mm-hmm. is something that everybody supports. Sure. Um, but the the problem uh, with the proposal is that in its implementation, and we've seen this a number of times, uh, it's had uh, an impact on abortion in a way that would um, loosen restrictions against abortion and particularly restrictions against abortion funding. Um, so um, the ERA proposal was was really moot. It was um, uh, something that uh, was proposed at the federal level back in the 1970s, and the uh, ratification period expired in the 1980s. Hmm. Um, however, um, uh, some groups are continuing to try to resurrect that and to uh, argue that that it's really not moot, um, even though it is. Um, but uh, the the concern from our standpoint, and it goes all the way back to the the USCCB's position in the 1970s, the USCCB insisted on abortion neutral language being added to the ERA to make sure that the these equal rights weren't going to be interpreted to mean that that um, women had an equal right to abortion uh, when compared to um, uh, 
health procedures in general. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we, of course, know that, that abortion uh, is not health care. It's the antithesis of health care. But the, the USCCB uh, asked for abortion neutral language. Uh, and when that was not added to the ERA, um, that, that um, um, uh, was, of course, very unfortunate. And it, it led to our position here today, mm-hmm. uh, which is that um, it, it has, we know that it has uh, a negative effect on the unborn. Um, just to give uh, uh, two quick examples on that, in um, New Mexico, uh, state equivalent ERA language was added to their constitution. And the result of that was that a court decided that New Mexico, New Mexico could not restrict um, state-funded abortions for that reason. They cited their, their ERA language. Hmm. Uh, likewise, that also happened uh, recently with a ruling coming out of Alaska. And there's also been a lawsuit in Pennsylvania. So these are very real cases of what the effect and harm to the unborn would have been had the ERA passed. It's really amazing. It's it's not something that most people think of when they think about the ERA, that there's an abortion component to it, even if it's not specifically written into the legislation. That's right. And, and um, I know that, that uh, our organization and some of the other uh, pro-life organizations that we worked alongside of um, really did a good job of, of helping to educate legislators and the public about that. And, and uh, pro-life legislators uh, really did a, a great job of, of articulating that when these came up for debates. And uh, the last thing that I wanted to say on the abortion issue is that uh, while we were there, very thankful that pro-life legislators um, did not uh, or, or stood against these negative proposals, we were also urging them to do something positive this mm-hmm. year on the abortion issue. Um, we, and we felt that in particular the pro-life community really wanted to see something good get done. And we're very happy that in the uh, state budget that um, our General Assembly has sent to the governor, it includes the Hyde Amendment abortion restrictions. Mm. So these are restrictions that have been placed in place at the federal level for more than 40 years. And it says that um, uh, abortions for Medicaid-eligible women um, cannot be paid for with government funds outside of the cases of life, rape, and incest, danger to the life of the mother, rape, mm-hmm. and incest. So um, the, this has been in place at the state level in most states, uh, but not Virginia. Hmm. Virginia goes beyond the, the federal hide restrictions and funds um, abortions with its own state money uh, in certain cases when the child might be born with disabilities, hmm. uh, when the doctor believes that, that a child would be born with certain disabilities. And um, so, so we've been um, fighting for years to try to uh, get Virginia to conform to the federal Hyde restrictions. And uh, we're very, very grateful that that's in the, the budget this year. That's a big victory for the Virginia Catholic Conference. Well, we're, we're certainly hopeful that that um, uh, sticks in the budget mm-hmm. and, and we'll be following that closely. And, and um, that, that really restricts uh, funding of abortion to the, the fullest extent possible. Mm-hmm. Um, so unless the federal government requires that it be funded, it would not be funded. And of course, our position is we don't think that any abortion should be funded and, and that, that abortion should be ended. Of course. Um, but this, is, this is a, a, would be a very, very strong incremental step forward. Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's wonderful. That's that's good news. And I hope it does stick. Um, so we know abortion was a big part of this session and we all saw the videos, um, saw the, the uh, Delegate Tran and, and Governor Northam on videos. Shocking uh, to hear what they had to say about about abortion. But abortion was just one of the many issues that you worked on this session. Jeff, I know one issue that was was big on the conference agenda this year was the death penalty. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. So for the last several years, the Virginia Catholic Conference, in coordination with other groups, has supported legislation to exempt people with severe mental illness from the death penalty. And um, unfortunately, over the years, uh, the... um, 
Virginia Catholic Conference has had to fight against a lot of expansions to mm-hmm. the death penalty. And it's only been in very recent years when we've been able to shift the conversation and start working on ways to potentially curb it. So this was one opportunity uh, that we've discovered over the last few years. And um, we've we've pushed, I believe this, is, this was the third year in a row that the legislation was introduced. And we had a really important gain this year. While it didn't make it all the way to the governor's desk, it actually passed the Senate. Mm-hmm. And um, I consider that really historic here in Virginia because it's just been it, it's a it's a really tough state when it comes to the death penalty mm-hmm. um, over, since our, our founding as a commonwealth. Um, we've executed more than 1,300 people. Goodness. In the uh, last 40 or so years, we've executed 111 people, mm. uh, which ranks uh, third only behind Texas and Oklahoma. Mm. And so uh, we've been uh, fighting uh, um, a lot of, of uh, uphill battles, mm-hmm. uh, but we think the conversation is is starting to turn in our direction. Uh, there, there haven't been any more death sentences handed down by juries since 2011 Hmm. here, I believe. Hmm. So I think we're trending in the right direction. And I think the General Assembly, too, is reflecting that. So this this bill that would have added a common sense exemption to the death penalty for people who had severe mental illnesses at the the time they committed their crime, Mm -hmm. um, that that passed the Senate. Then it died in a, a House subcommittee, uh, but that was really historic progress. I don't, I don't recall any other uh, time uh, in in our history when we've passed uh, even in one chamber uh, legislation to curb the death penalty. Oh, so we're making progress bit by bit, even though that legislation will probably have to come back next year. That's correct. Yeah. Can you talk about some of the other um, issues you worked on and 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 how they ended up? Well, Diana, you highlighted religious liberty earlier, and I'm really glad you did because there was uh, quite a bit of of effort on that front as well. We saw legislation that would have mandated that health plans require uh, procedures such as abortion and contraception and sterilization, abortion-inducing drugs, and also uh, gender transition procedures. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, um, each one of those bills was defeated, uh, but certainly that that would have very, very serious um, religious liberty implications. Absolutely. Um, Likewise, there there were um, some bills uh, in the uh, area of non-discrimination that uh, sought to add uh, the classifications of sexual orientation and gender identity to our state's non-discrimination laws. Uh, such as in the area of housing. And our concern about that is that it it would have uh, called into question whether we could practice our beliefs on marriage, that marriage is the union of a man and a woman. And so uh, we participated in that debate and and said that if if legislation like that were to pass, it would be extremely important to add a religious exemption uh, to make sure that, that our Catholic social service providers Mm -hmm. and colleges and universities could provide housing in a manner that's consistent with their beliefs. So this is really the freedom to serve. Sure. This is the, the, um, you know, we we cannot sever our um, beliefs from our services. Mm -hmm. They're both part of our faith. We can't separate our faith from our works. And so it's very important that we protect that freedom to serve as we go forward. Right. Oh, that's great. Great. Um, other issues that you worked on, I know the scholarship tax credit was a big, uh, big part of this session. Yes. Yeah, so in 2012, the Virginia General Assembly enacted a program that we strongly support, which is the Education Improvement Scholarships Tax Credits Program. Mm, that's a mouthful. Uh, for short, sure, <laughs> I'll call it scholarship tax credits. Okay. <laughs> so um, those scholarship tax credits have helped thousands of children uh, access a non-public K-12 through education. Mm. And the way the program works is that uh, donors, and they can be either individuals or businesses, uh, would donate to state-approved scholarship foundations in the Diocese of Arlington and Diocese of Richmond each have one. Mm -hmm. And uh, those uh, donors in return would receive a 65% state tax credit on their donation. And then the scholarship foundations use 
those donations to provide uh, scholarships, financial assistance to low income K through 12 students so that they can, if they choose, attend a, a non public school. So there are certain eligibility requirements, but it mm -hmm. basically helps lower income students and uh, particularly those that are uh, entering the school system for the first time, whether it be kindergarten or first grade, or they might be moving in from out of the state. But it's, it's helped uh, thousands of children already. And, and what we've been seeking over the last few years is to add pre-K to the program hmm. so that not only could K through 12 students benefit, but, but also pre-K students as well. And we know how much emphasis pre-K education is getting in, in our state and, and for very good reasons that that early education is very, very important. So um, a bill that would have said that if there are no public options available in, in a particular locality, mm -hmm. um, that, that those, in, in those cases, pre-K students could qualify for this program, that, that legislation's passed. It was a four-year process, and wow. it, it was enacted this year. And uh, so, so we're very, uh, very grateful for, for that development as well. Hmm. So that's an example of how you said four years ago, it's been, it's been in the works for four years, this kind of expansion of that program. So that's an example of how uh, you keep chipping away. Every year you keep, keep, keep working at it, and eventually you, you meet with success. Absolutely. A lot of people work together on that, a lot of different organizations, and also, again, the grassroots. That's great. Um, other issues that you worked on this session? Well, one uh, other issue that's that's very important for, for children certainly is is the, the issue of mandatory reporting mm -hmm. of child abuse and neglect. Yes. And there was uh, legislation uh, introduced this year uh, that would require clergy to be to be added to the state's mandatory reporter list. And we supported that legislation uh, as we did back in 2006. Uh, the legislation includes an exemption for clergy penitent communications, uh, but but with, with that exception, um, it would otherwise require, uh, apart from that exception, it would require clergy uh, when they learn of an instance of child abuse or neglect to the, report that to the state authority. So uh, we supported the bill. Um, uh, you know, certainly uh, it strengthens protections for mm -hmm. children. It also, with the exemption for clergy uh, penitent communications, it respects religious doctrines and mm -hmm. practices. And um, I think it's also important to note that, that it um, complements our existing diocesan practices mm -hmm. and also consistent with our previous position. We supported the bill in 2006 okay. as well. It passed this year. It passed. That's great. That's wonderful. Um, I know there were a couple other pieces of legislation, many other pieces, but uh, just a few more that we want to mention real quickly. Um, surrogacy was, was one of those um, pieces of legislation. Yes, there was legislation that we opposed uh, that would expand uh, surrogacy, the state surrogacy law to include same-sex couples as well as unmarried individuals. And, and uh, we had a lot of concerns about it from the standpoint of, of um, uh, definition of, of family and uh, best interest of children. Mm -hmm. But I think two of our most serious concerns really kind of harken back to, to life itself. Um, in these surrogacy situations, it often involves IVF. Mm -hmm. And in IVF, uh, uh, embryos are created and it's normally not just one embryo it's 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 multiple embryos being created and and that leaves these so-called spare embryos that sometimes end up getting uh, frozen indefinitely or even destroyed and and there are uh, 620,000 of these quote unquote mm -hmm. spare embryos across the country and um, our our concern about this legislation is that when you expand the surrogacy law, you expand the number of embryos that are going to be created, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. many of them subsequently destroyed. And then one particular concern too, uh, on the legislation actually relates directly to abortion. Uh, surrogacy contracts sometimes require that the the mother carrying the child for the intended parents is sometimes required by contract uh, to seek an abortion mm -hmm. uh, if um, um, 
more than than uh, if she ends up carrying more than one child mm-hmm. or if there are certain health conditions. Mm-hmm. So um, uh, there were actually two different opportunities to restrict abortion in our, our surrogacy law and to say that these contracts couldn't require that, but they, they both failed. Both, okay. both of those failed. Good. Well, I'm glad to hear that. Well, it sounds like you had a very no, busy. Well, no, uh, to clarify, no, the, the, we, we wanted those amendments to pass to, to we wanted those amendments on the legislation um, to to say that, a, that those contracts couldn't include requiring abortion. And those amendments unfortunately failed. Those amendments yeah, unfortunately that, that failed. It. And unfortunately, the, the bill then passed, even without those amendments on, it still passed. That's the fight we're going to have to continue, I believe. Yeah. Yes. Jeff, it's been great to hear about the different things that you worked on this session. Um, before we go, I know there are two things that you wanted to to pass on to our listeners, two important things. Uh, one is an upcoming event, and the second is the network. Yes. So uh, capitalizing on the momentum uh, that's been created for protecting the unborn uh, through the the um, uh, negative legislation that was defeated, as well as some of the, the positive gains that we've made. Uh, there's the first ever Virginia March for Life in mm-hmm. Richmond, and we're really grateful to our, our partners, National Right to Life, as well as the Family Foundation, Virginia Society for Human Life. Working together with those organizations, we're organizing a, a March for Life in Richmond. It's great. So you can find out all sorts of information about that on our website. And, and then your website again is? Is www.vacatholic.org. Okay, and, great. Um, and then we, we would also, of course, strongly encourage people to sign up for our network to receive alerts and updates. And, and if you go right to the top, there's uh, join the network feature and you can follow that. Wonderful. And so we urge all of our listeners to check out the Virginia Catholic Conference at vacatholic.org to subscribe to the email action alerts and to take action on those alerts. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you, Diana. This has been great. I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for listening to Searching for More. If you enjoyed this podcast, please write a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. Also, make sure you follow the Diocese and the Arlington Catholic Herald on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And subscribe to our YouTube channels for regular videos that will inspire, educate, and inform you about the Catholic faith and our diocesan community.